Um, it is now my pleasure to introduce two of my former uh, chiefs of uh, surgery, Dr. David Feliciano and Dr. Ken Maddox, who will debate on the merits and risks of hypotensive resuscitation. Both are co-authors of the definitive textbook, Trauma, currently in its seventh edition. Dr. Maddox will speak first. Um, uh, Dr. Maddox earned his undergraduate degree from uh, Wayland College in Plainview, Texas, and his medical degree from Baylor College of Medicine. He's authored hundreds of scholarly papers and too many talks to actually count anymore. Um, for, the fast, for the past 47 years, he's organized the renowned trauma conference, sorry, Trauma, Critical Care, and Acute Care Surgery at Caesars Palace um, in Las Vegas, a conference that attracts over 1,000 surgeons from the, all over the world every year. And so we will start with Dr. Maddox. Dr. Reed, Dr. Nakotra, CAST, congratulations on uh, launching a new approach to communications and education. We all can use that, particularly the politicians on both parties in our country, uh, but that's beyond the scope of this uh, conference. I have one disclosure as I begin, and um, how do I launch my slides? There, I've got it, okay. Uh, I have one disclosure as I start, and that is I have a competing conference in Las Vegas. So uh, uh, just be aware of that. As I uh, begin, I assume correctly or incorrectly, that Dr. Feliciano's objectives for this debate is to discredit me and to make me look old, although I don't dye my hair white. And he wants to win the debate. My objectives are to uh, help you save badly injured patients by bringing you up to date on where we are on uh, caring for them. I'll summarize my talk in case I run out of time. Uh, that is three points. And it's three things you should eliminate from your vernacular, from your discussion, from your language. Number one, sphygmomanometer is an instrument of the devil that ought to be in the curiosity section of the medical museum. Do away with blood pressure. Number two, Eliminate crystalloids from your treatment, particularly normal saline. Number three, forget the word resuscitation. Hypotensive resuscitation debate and resuscitation is the most misrepresented concept in the 21st uh, century. Hypotension is in the eyes of the beholder. Hypotension is a teleologic activity that occurred to be protective and to protect the uh, organism. Both, which has been shown in both the wars uh, in the uh, Iraq and in Afghanistan and the wars of the streets of our cities. <clears throat> the objectives of uh, uh, resuscitation, the old word, is to have a person who is alive, restore normal function, create no new problems, and to return the person to work or their previous activity. Short recovery if possible. There are terms. What does hypotension really mean? It's usually associated with blood pressure rather than perfusion and rather than blood loss, et cetera, et cetera. <clears throat> Resuscitation for trauma in the past has been to exceed the pre-injury level of, of uh, the blood pressure. And to, um, what does that really mean? Or is it a level of 90, 70, or even 50? Much of that will enter into the debate tomorrow or the discussion tomorrow with Reboa. How do we assess our resuscitation? It's a functional CNS status. The person can give us their name, rank, serial number, tell us where they live, give us a telephone number. There are chemical measures of acidosis or elevation of uh, lactate, a lower urinary output, 
temperature, cold and clammy, <clears throat> arterial oxygen saturation and blood volume measurements could be done. This can be done very easily by asking the person their name, rank and serial number and feeling for a peripheral pulse. Quite honestly, those two measures alone are correlated with outcome much better than blood pressure. Of all the things we do and measure, blood pressure correlates least, least with outcome than anything else. It is really very simple in this debate. Look to the outcome objectives, look to collateral damage, remove hysteria, static, and turf issues, and get on with doing what we need to do. The historic approach is over. The three to one rule was never ever tested in people. It, it was a concept of Dallas for a whole different set of, um, uh, of research. Patient recognition, uh, recognize the patient who needs resuscitation, even in the new resuscitation concepts, and who does not. The majority of patients do not need any sort of interference, period. Do not pass go, do not collect $200. <clears throat> the majority of all trauma patients uh, uh, stabilize and need control of bleeding, may need, may need an operation, they may need a la uh, suturing of a laceration, but they do, certainly do not need to be hurt more by this old concept of resuscitation. Can and does circulation occur in a hypotensive patient? Of course. The endpoints we've already talked about and do not need to repeat. Fluid resuscitation in the past has been accomplished in the ambulance, the helicopter, the emergency room, the operating room, and the ICU. Data exists now that fluid resuscitation for the purpose of elevating blood pressure should not be done in the ambulance, the helicopter, the emergency room, and probably the operating room as well, probably the ICU. There are historic re uh, papers which support this, which go back to the early 60s. Uh, permissive hypotension occurred uh, uh, at that time. With the Vietnam experience, we began to o fluid overload patients and all of the new set of problems uh, that occur from uh, that activity uh, was well uh, documented. Everyone recognizes the 1994 big bomb that occurred with the uh, first large study on immediate uh, versus delayed fluid resuscitation in penetrating trauma in young men with fast transport time in Houston, uh, Texas. And I will not uh, repeat all of that data uh, at this point. There's novel new evaluations by keeping it simple. Abandon the use of the sphygmomanometer. Abandon the sphygmomanometer. Many units in, Vietnam, in uh, Iraq and Afghanistan did not take a sphygmomanometer with them. Mental status and the presence of a pulse are sufficient, period. But the question remains, does aggressive crystalloid fluid resuscitation make a difference? The answer is yes. It increases Mortality, complications, ARDS, hospital ICU, and cost. The main objective by our colleagues who still bow to the old shrine of crystalloid resuscitation, do so to raise the blood pressure. And that raising the blood pressure creates all sorts of problems. It is to this group of people with whom we teach ATLS, many other courses, give courses like this, must underscore that this is a way to help our patients do worse, uh, not better. <clears throat> the function of the emergency center in the hypotensive trauma patient who is sick is to wave to the patient as they go from the ambulance bay to the OR or the ICU. There is absolutely nothing that can be done in that emergency room that's going to benefit the, this kind of patient. 
and there is a determinable mortality with every three minutes that pass in staying in that location. So wave to them as they go to the interstices of the hospital and uh, receive their care. Evaluation and resuscitation in the emergency center only adds time and complications to the patient that is not going to go home today. Uh, I could talk about the various uh, resuscitation origins. That's historic. We will, uh, uh, in the interest of time, move uh, uh, beyond that. I can say that in the military campaigns, the best results in the history of warfare with the worst in, uh, instruments of destruction of any wars in history uh, occurred uh, during the Iraq and Afghanistan war. Despite uh, uh, that, with crystalloid uh, restriction and with hypotensive resuscitation, we had the best results ever. A tremendous editorial to support the side for which I am trying to convince you, to convince all of your friends to abide by. What happens with too much crystalloid? Um, you know what happens, including pop the clot. Uh, alteration of microcirculation and inflammatory activity. And not all fluids are created equal, and this is not a, a talk on the differences of all of those uh, different fluids. Many of them create the coagulopathy that has resulted in a lot of new drugs, new concepts that probably is not necessary if we limit the resuscitation entirely. The coagulopathies, uh, again, this is not a lecture on the coagulopathies. Numerous articles, numerous articles written by individuals, including in this audience, have been written which uh, support this uh, concept. At what blood pressure does one pop the clot? Remember, the clotting and the hypotension are protective. As you resuscitate somebody, you pop the clot, creating more bleeding, need for more blood, need for more crystalloid if you believed in that. And in both the animals and in humans, the clot is popped at 80. 80. I personally like to see a patient in the shock room, the ambulance, and in the operating room with a systolic pressure of 70. I finally will, will, uh, will uh, stop this part of the debate by sharing with you an interesting case that occurred in Hertzville, North Dakota in 1992. A young boy had both arms severed in a farm accident. Here's the article about him. You, you, you can't read this from where you are. And so I have um, summarized it for you in the next couple of slides. This was a simple farm boy. He um, lost both arms. He walked in the snow. He opened the door with his mouth, picked up a pencil with his teeth, dialed for help, and um, he lived. He had a sister. That sister is a simple farm girl. She doesn't have an MD. She doesn't have a PhD in physiology. She doesn't debate resuscitation at national and international conferences. But she said he did not bleed to death because he was in shock. How can a simple farm girl be more cogent in her thinking than a learned professor of surgery that's been in Houston, in Mayo, in, uh, uh, in New York, in Atlanta, and now is debating among this international group of uh, uh, trauma scholars. She wanted to keep him in shock. My opponent wants to tell you that resuscitation is good. So I leave you with a thought of Machiavelli of the Prince. There is nothing more difficult to take in hand, more perilous to conduct, or more uncertain in its success than to take the lead in the introduction of new order of things, a new way of giving a conference, huh? Because the innovator has for enemies all of those who have done well under the old 
and lukewarm defenders in those who might do well under the new. Thank you for letting me give you this side of this argument. Um, for the rebuttal, I am uh, proud to welcome uh, my, my uh, former professor, Dr. David Feliciano. Dr. Feliciano received his medical degree from Georgetown University School of Medicine, where he graduated cum laude and was a member of the Alpha Omega Alpha Medical Honor Society. He did his general surgery at the Mayo Clinic, uh, did trauma at Wayne State, a vascular surgery fellowship at Baylor, has authored more than 580 publications, including book chapters and hundreds of lectures. He is currently the Battersby Professor of Surgery and the Chief of General Surgery at Indiana University. Um, I, I will mention the rules now that Dr. Maddox has finished. Um, points will be awarded for scientific accuracy, uh, thoughtful analysis, uh, humor. Points will be deducted for uh, misuse of data, speaking in a lower octave, <laughs> referencing New England Journal of Medicine articles prior to 2000, <laughs> and the winner gets a, pa a plaque with that. <laughs> Dr. Feliciano. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. It's a real pleasure to be here. Uh, I'm going to shorten my lecture much as Dr. Maddox did, because we'll run out of time. But I, I do want to tell you that Dr. Maddox is absolutely right. <laughs> I do not trust him. And let me give you one uh, cogent example here. This was the cover of the sixth edition of our trauma book when I was the lead editor. At the very top, you see a nice operative picture of me doing a Whipple procedure in my general surgery practice. This is the cover of our seventh edition when Dr. Maddox was the editor-in-chief. And if you look at the bottom, you'll notice he's cut off my damn head. <laughs> I think Dr. Maddox forgot about one thing, that shock is bad for you. While most internal organs like the lungs, liver, and kidneys can lose as much as 75% of their functional mass without life-threatening organ failure, loss of only 35 to 40% of blood can be fatal from Paul Marino's most recent edition of the ICU book. We've known about shock for a long time. This is the famous description by Samuel Gross, the rude unhinging of the machinery of life. Many famous people, as Ken mentioned, have written books about shock. This is Walter Cannon's book, which we'll get back to in just a minute. Uh, Dr. Blaylock at Johns Hopkins wrote another book about shock. So there's been a progressive increase in knowledge over time as compared to the early uh, 1900s. The things we do know about shock are there are well-recognized hemodynamic and cutaneous responses and these are the body's response, their compensation to a sudden drop in blood pressure. And secondly, we know that when you have anaerobic metabolism, that is a negative base deficit or an increased lactate, you have cell damage. And if you don't reverse the shock state, at some point cell damage becomes permanent, patient goes into irreversible shock and dies. The other things we know is the way we have resuscitated patients historically is wrong, certainly. I mean, when we use lactated ringers or packed red cells, none of them increase cardiac index as much as whole blood or dextran, things we haven't historically used in uh, civilian trauma centers. This is also from Marino's book. The other thing we know to the left is that when you have acute hemorrhage, you're bleeding whole blood. If you resuscitate only with water, you're gonna dilute what hemoglobin is left and the patient ends up anemic. So we know a lot of uh, new things, if you will. The debate today is really about timing. I want you to think about that. This all started with Walter Cannon, one of the most famous physiologists of the 20th century. This is a quote that Ken and John Holcomb and many people in the military repeatedly show to audiences if the pressure is raised before the surgeon is ready to check the bleeding that may take place, blood that is sorely needed may be lost. You'll note that paper was in JAMA in 1918. I'm kind of a historian in surgery and I don't think my military colleagues or Ken read beyond that. 
because this is from the same author five years later, if the blood pressure has fallen below a critical level of 80 and has shown no evidence of rising, it is desirable that it be raised to 120 millimeters of mercury, et cetera, et cetera. Walter Cannon, Traumatic Shock Textbook, 1923. So the debate continues because even in the minds of the people who initiated the debate, they're still confused. Now this has prompted a lot of studies over the years. Here's an interesting study from 1992. Femoral bloodletting in laboratory animals, dogs. Early resuscitation after trauma could aid patients even if arterial pressure is unchanged. This benefit might be even greater in patients with uncontrolled bleeding. Well, it's a dog study, who knows? Here's the famous tail resection in rats. Cut off the tail, see what happens and how long it takes them to bleed to death. Rapid infusion of isotonic saline improves survival in uncontrolled hemorrhage. So as Dr. Maddox is kind of hinting to you that this debate has been clearly solved in his own mind, it has not. It has not. Well, let's talk about the uh, paper that Ken uh, alluded to, and I'm incredibly envious of Ken. I have never had a paper published in New England Journal or JAMA, and he has, and I'm very bitter about that, but I'll get over it. <laughs> so this was a very interesting study that Bill Bickle and Ken did, and as Ken mentioned briefly, these were adults with gunshot wounds or stab wounds to the trunk who were hypotensive, and the protocol was mainly about pre-hospital care up to the operating room. And there were, as he mentioned, two groups. Immediate fluid resuscitation, as we historically have done, or so-called delayed resuscitation. And the data are pretty clear. The immediate group got a lot of fluid pre-hospital in the emergency room and got more blood. And they clearly differentiated themselves into two groups. It's interesting that the group that got fluid resuscitation, not surprisingly, had a higher blood pressure upon arrival to the trauma center. Uh, you'll note that it's under Ken's critical 80. I think the most frightening aspect of this study and the one that prompted the most criticism was that these were profoundly hypotensive men, primarily, with gunshot wounds to the chest or abdomen, and the time from when they arrived in the trauma center until they went to the operating room was 40 to 50 minutes. Now, I want you to all think about that in your own trauma center. Is that an acceptable number in any trauma center? No, not even close. Who would ever take a patient with a blood pressure of 80 and leave them in the emergency room for 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 minutes? Now, I know why, because I worked with Ken for 11 years, and they have too many gunshot wounds to operate on at once. But frankly, these are unacceptable numbers. So what were the outcomes? The survival was better in the delayed resuscitation group. Intraoperative blood loss was better, but not significant. And the length of stay, which can depend on many things, was better in the uh, delayed group as well. So this uh, paper was widely touted as being the death of pre-hospital and emergency room resuscitation. But God, it had a lot of problems. 95% of the patients in the American College of Surgeons National Trauma Data Bank have blunt trauma. Penetrating trauma is a phenomenon in a few big cities in America, not a, not a classic test group. Delay to the operating room, as I mentioned, was almost 50 minutes. They use the injury severity score classification of injuries. Anybody who knows the history of AIS and ISS knows that Bill Haddon and Susan Baker and others wrote this for car crashes. You can't possibly use ISS as a reasonable way to categorize the magnitude of a penetrating injury. It just doesn't work. There was no discrimination of patients with abdominal vascular wounds. Suppose five patients in one group had wounds to the abdominal aorta and five patients in the other group did not. Is there gonna be a difference in mortality? It's about 20 to 30% in that small group. And I, I won't touch on the last thing. So what happened after Ken's paper in 1994? For reasons that aren't totally clear to me, the military just became totally enamored with this. And they adopted pre-hospital hypotensive resuscitation in the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. What's really interesting to me is that there have been two papers this year on trauma in military casualties. 
one in JAMA surgery, one still to be published, where military surgeons talked about how they resuscitate in those wars. And the Golden Hour paper published earlier this year did not even mention hypotensive resuscitation, not a word. The Golden Hour paper recently presented at the Southwestern Surgical, which has some incredibly interesting data about people who are wounded so badly, they bleed so fast, it doesn't matter what kind of resuscitation you do, they're gonna still die. That paper didn't mention hypotensive resuscitation either. So the military appears to have some ambivalence about it as well, but I'll tell you, the civilian community never adopted hypotensive resuscitation outside of Houston. Here's a study from shock trauma, arguably the most prominent trauma center in the United States. Here's a study in civilian casualties, titration of initial fluid therapy to a lower than normal systolic BP during active hemorrhage did not affect mortality. Here's a report and injury reviewing all the papers on hypotensive resuscitation a year ago. Decision making regarding pre-hospital IV fluid resuscitation is critical and may need to be tailored to the individual situation. I think this frustrated the people in Houston. I mean, I, I would be frustrated too to have a paper in New England Journal of Medicine and then have other people like myself go around and criticize it. So they did another study. It's got a long title, but it's about hypotensive resuscitation, and Ken is the senior author. What were the criteria in this study? These were young, predominantly men, with either blunt or penetrating trauma to the chest or abdomen who were hypotensive in the field. And when they got to the operating room, they were randomized to a mean arterial pressure of 65 in one arm in the study and 50 in the other. For those of you who have forgotten your physiology, a mean arterial pressure uh, colloquially is known as perfusion pressure. And there are a couple formulas you can use. The one at the bottom is the one that's most commonly used, but let me help you with this. A normal human being has a MAP over 90, and you can see some of the other blood pressure ranges and what kind of MAP you get from that. The two arms of the Houston study were 80 over 60, and 70 over 40. Those were the two maps that uh, resulted, uh, that were used in the study. There were some real problems with this study. Here's the two groups, the resuscitation group in the OR, MAP 65, versus no resuscitation. The group that got resuscitated, the way I like to do it, had a 25% greater magnitude of abdominal and chest injuries in ISS, and received 35 to 40% more pack red cells and platelets. In other words, these groups, ignoring their blood pressure, were not matched. They just weren't. There were some real sick people in the resuscitation group. And if you look at the results, they're fascinating. No difference, no difference, no difference, and a double death rate in the people who were resuscitated at 24 hours. If you're a casual reader of a paper like this, you're gonna say, oh my God, he's proven his point. Not true. More severely injured patients die earlier. You didn't need to do a real complex study to prove that. And I think they also prove without question that intraoperative fluid management, whether you give a lot or not, if you don't stop the bleeding, the fluid management does not affect mortality. So I think these two studies have some imperfections. I congratulate the Houston group for going through these complex clinical studies. But I think the reason a lot of civilian centers just sort of gloss over this is that hypotensive resuscitation to a fixed map, like Ken said, 80, just makes no sense to me. Everybody's different, everybody's magnitude of injury is different, the size of the blood vessel that's bleeding is different. You can't pick a number for all trauma patients, it makes no sense. And I think one of the things that came out of the 94 study is nobody read the paper carefully and, and recognized these were all gunfighters who were 29 years old. Hypotensive resuscitation should, is absolutely contraindicated people and people my age and Ken's age. You'll kill us. You will absolutely kill us. We'll stroke or have an MI. It's contradicted in people with traumatic brain injuries. What's the two or three worst things you can do to a brain injured patient? Let them get hypoxic. Let them get hypotensive, let them get hyperthermic, and let them have a seizure. It'll, it'll fry the rest of their brain. 
And these studies have nothing to do with what goes on in America. The transit times for trauma patients to a trauma center in the United States vary from 20 minutes in San Francisco and Houston and Indianapolis to hours and hours in the Intermountain West, the rural Southeast, the Northwest. You can't leave some patient, even a 30-year-old, with a blood pressure of 50 that whole time. That's just nonsense. You have to discriminate between your patients. And I think one of the things I learned from Ken and other people in Houston is you just take these patients to the operating room and stop the bleeding. You sit there and dick around for 50 minutes, you're gonna kill people no matter what their blood pressure is. It's all about source control. When I was chief of surgery at Grady, the first memo I sent out was, there's a 10 minute limit in the emergency room for every hypotensive trauma patient with injury to the chest, the neck, the abdomen, or an extremity. They have to be out in 10 minutes. It may mean angio on occasion, may mean a CAT scan if you're in South America, if they've been stabilized, but for many of the patients, 10 minutes to the operating room is the right thing to do. Then you don't even have a debate about how much fluid to give. There are no data that hypotensive resuscitation is gonna prevent the coagulopathy of trauma, right? That occurs in 25% of patients in the field. We don't know why. We do know it's reversible if you stop their bleeding. And I think the biggest problem with this hypotensive resuscitation argument is that not giving fluids and blood to a profoundly hypotensive patient who is on the verge of bradycardia is simply unethical. They're going to die. Shock is bad for you. I don't know if a pressure of 80 or 90 or 100 is the right thing to do, but believe me, folks, if you leave all these patients at 50 millimeters of mercury, in a large series with many different uh, origins of trauma, it's not gonna work, it just won't work. So I, I don't really know what to say in conclusion about what you all should do, but I know that <clears throat> if you have hypotensive resuscitation to a MAP of 65, maybe it's appropriate in an occasional young patient who's been shot and is bleeding and has 20 minutes to get to the hospital but I'm not convinced by the available data that even this is true. And then we have the ongoing debate now initiated in Japan about whether we ought to be floating balloons up these patients' aortas in either the ambulance, the emergency room, or the operating room, and ignoring any argument about fluid resuscitation. Thanks very much, everybody. So um, uh, I'm going to invite uh, both of our speakers back up for a minute, and uh, we are going to uh, take questions from the audience and also questions from uh, those uh, uh, people listening on the simulcast. So, so while, uh, while folks are getting up here, um, there was a, a brief mention, um, uh, Dr. Maddox, about the, uh, the fact that um, uh, low blood pressure is a way for the for the body to um, to it's a it's a helpful response. It helps us. Um, but patients who are head injured often get hypertensive. Their blood pressures go up tremendously. So, um, do you think that 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 nature is telling us something different for head injuries than it's telling us for uh, patients with blood loss? The um, mechanisms are different. And the Cushing response is, is well known. So um, the body sometimes responds uh, in a very schizophrenic way. The coagulopathy issue is one that we don't fully understand as well. What really causes it, what prevents it, we, do, we really don't know yet. So um, I, uh, I can't give you a direct uh, uh, answer, but um, I do believe that... Uh, uh, the hypotension to a level. And there is a level which is critical, and for that I would agree. Uh, but um, I don't know what the body's, uh, the body's schizophrenic in its response in the head <laughs> and uh, in response to blood loss. Okay. So, um, Clay, I, um, I don't have any questions coming up on my screen. So um, I think with that, I'm going to have Ray uh, come up and... Um, 
And uh, I, I did mislead you at the beginning because I said that the winner of the talk would, would get a plaque. And the reality is that um, both of our uh, invited uh, speakers are getting plaques. So if, uh, if uh, we can uh, welcome uh, both of these guys, we'll get some. Uh... Well, while you're, while you're blabbering, yeah. um, <laughs> I, I think it should not be lost on any of the audiences on the things we agreed on. We agreed on um, that um, uh, staying in the emergency center on patients with these kinds of injuries that need to go be in the operating room uh, is, is not good. So get out of the emergency room as quickly as you can. Second, uh, these individuals need blood and need whole blood. And they need blood concomitant with stop the bleeding. And if we leave nothing else with you other than get to the operating room fast, don't fiddle around wherever you're fiddling around, whether it's in radiology, on, uh, emergency room, or anywhere else, unless that's going to alter your treatment plan, and stop the bleeding, and uh, get on with uh, repairing what uh, uh, the deficit is, and give whole blood, uh, those we agreed upon. Those we agreed upon, and those principles are probably more important than a mean blood pressure. Uh, Dr. Feliciano was critical of our experimental design. Let me tell you, uh, for any of those of you who have done such studies, th th these are tough. And with the limited fluid in the field, the number of people that we used to see who were profoundly hypotensive at 30 minutes an hour in every city in the country decreased. There's some data there for us to build on to say why. And that's an opportunity for uh, further research. All right, with that, uh, Dr. Feliciano, I present to you our first, thank you, our, our first uh, keynote debate. Okay. Apologize for the uh, delay there. No problem. And for Dr. Maddox. Dr. Maddox. Here, I see. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks, everybody.